Hi friends, and welcome to another segment of Zeal Theological Ministry. My name is Harold Massey, I'm a teaching minister, and Zeal Theological Ministry is based off of Romans 12. That is to be better informed of Him, so we can be better transformed by Him. Friends, I truly am grateful and glad to be back here with you this week. I had some uh, impromptu and unplanned trips that came up that resulted in me being out of town. Uh, the travels, the interactions, and the discussions all were tremendous blessings to my family and myself. I'm also grateful for Roy and Pastor Morris, who manifest the loving heart of our ministry, week after week, with consistency. Our hope and desire is that our multilinguistic, uh, our multilinguistical approach has been, is being, and will be a blessing to you. Now, if you've been following along with uh, these segments, you know today lands us uh, in Romans chapter 10 as we study and navigate our way through the book of Romans. So, like always, let's seek God first in prayer, read the passages for today together, and continue our conversation. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we just thank you and praise you for all the blessings you've given us. Lord, we thank you that you've given us another day where your word can be exhorted, Lord. Lord, I thank you that your word never leaves devoid of touching our hearts and reaching the right ears. Lord, I pray that as I speak about your word and you've influenced this and directed these words all throughout the weeks as I prepare for this, and Lord, as you prepare the hearts and the minds of the people that are uh, yearning to hear these words, Lord, I pray that you just bless us in and through your word. And Lord, that may we be better worshipers because of this. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Amen. Friends, uh, today's scripture reading will be uh, the entirety of Romans chapter 10. Now, understandably, several of your eyebrows <laughs> must have been raised and eye eyes widened at the thought of 21 verses, but I'm here to assure you that we will be speaking more about the essence and the substance that these verses really encapsulate. So really, my goal for today's sermon is to be, in, a, in effect, a little shorter, a little more brief, because of a very specific reason, which we'll discuss soon. Now, uh, to, uh, I'll be reading out of the ESV translation, since the ESV and the NLT translations correctly title the key verses in this chapter for our benefit. Simply put, unlike the NIV, which is right now on its fifth rendition according to the biblical societies, um, the ESV and the NLT not only properly help us read the continuity from Romans chapter 9, but it helps us correctly see the spiritual application and implication of Romans 10 as well. So if you need a title for today's sermon, uh, today's sermon is titled Walking in Footprints. Uh, it's more of a, it's not going to be a typical sermon. Uh, it might uh, hurt a little bit, uh, depending on who you are and what you've experienced. Uh, it's more of a uh, pastoral sermon or a pastoral plea on pastoral ship. So Romans 10 verses 1 through 21. I'll be reading out of the ESV if you want to follow along. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I, bear for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now, this portion is titled in the, in the uh, ESV and the NLT, The Message of Salvation to All. For Moses writes, verse 5, for Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law, that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven. That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth, in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. Amen. For the, now, for those of you that follow along week after week, you've come to an expectation that in uncovering the depths of Scripture, many times we have large conversations out of the richness of just a few words or just a few verses. However, today you can almost say we will have one of the most important conversations that though the verses we just read are many, the conversation we're about to have is much more simple, direct, concise, and clear. And as many of uh, as the verses may be that were just read, its implications are innumerable or for many more. As I mentioned earlier, keeping to get today's segment uh, concise and clear and, and, and focused um, is to ensure that we don't lose sight of the importance of the substance of this chapter, Romans 10. And, uh, and one of the topics is smack right in the middle of the chapter, and that topic is the gospel. More clearly, the preaching of the gospel, the confession of faith because of the proper exhortation of the gospel, which leads to salvation. Sure, the Apostle Paul uses logic, philosophical reasoning, wisdom, hermeneutical connections to the Torah, uh, but all of which is packaged and enclosed in a pastoral plea, which is the essence and sub substance of what a faithful pastor's heart should be. The pastor's heart is that which seeks the benefit and advancement of others. This is why the introduction of this chapter in verse 1 is a powerful, prayerful, heartfelt plea for the salvation of all its readers. And this really is a timely conversation because of the conditions we are in within Christianity today. Now, we've covered the context of the book of Romans in many of our previous and early segments in our study through this book, but let's address a few technical and academic points quickly. The Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans while he was in Corinth uh, in about 56 AD. And we know this from Romans chapter 16, where he references geographical locations and people uh, like Phoebe, Gaius, Erastus, all who were associated with Corinth. We also know that uh, though the Apostle Paul is the author of the book of Romans, it was written by the hand of his amanuensis, Tertius. And this information is also found in Romans chapter 16. Now, before some of the academic and technical thinkers uh, say things like, and, and come, come right at me and say that, well, technically, Paul didn't write the book of Romans. Well, <laughs> he did. He authored the book, just like any modern writer would author a book. But a, but a publishing company brings that author's work to print. Or better yet, the entirety of Scripture is the words of God, inspired by the Spirit of God through the use of divinely appointed and purposed 
humans. In those days, it was quite common. Um, it was quite a, a common practice for most authors to have an emanuensis. These individuals would be selected by the authors so they may dictate to them as they wrote their words down verbatim and accurately. Now, I'd like to share a short, amusing story before we go any further. The story is about 20 years old, so if you've heard this before, please bear with me as there's a reason for my sharing it. The story is about a large, prestigious speaking and coaching event where the best speakers from around the globe had gathered. Now, before the conference began, there was a centralized cocktail hour for everyone that was gathered for the uh, you know, attendees and speakers. A well-known Englishman who was one of the speakers walks to his assigned table and he sees a Japanese man who looked quite nervous with a plate of food in front of him. The Englishman decides to help the Japanese man and visually assist him uh, as he lifted his utensils in a way to explain what they meant in English. He tells the nervous Japanese man, this spoony, this forky, this knifey, this platey, okay? <laughs> and to each example, the Japanese man had just nodded yes along. Now, as the evening progressed, uh, to the Englishman's shock, he discovered that the Japanese man was actually the main keynote speaker of the event. And furthermore, the man delivered his speech in flawless English. <laughs> After the event was done, the Japanese man finds the Englishman and asks him, my speechy, likey? <laughs> Friends, just like the story, unfortunately, this happens quite a bit in Christianity. In my journey, I have encountered many arrogant and prideful pastors, teachers, preachers who yield and roar about their convictions, but they never get to know their listeners. They often call out falsehoods and heresies in others without ever respecting their listeners enough to reason and give them an explanation of their own convictions. Sound familiar? This is the Pharisaism that Jesus confronted the teachers of the law and the religious elites with. And this sort of Pharisaism not only continues today, but has evolved and grown into entire doctrines and movements as well. So the Apostle Paul pleads with the Jews who trust the law in verses 2 through 7. These are Jewish leaders in the church that are reading this letter. He tell, uh, uh, from verses 2 through 7, uh, he, he explains to them that you may have a knowledge of the righteousness of God through the law, but that knowledge is not an acknowledgement of God himself. And that's the Greek word that's, uh, that's used there, really, which is epignosis. This translates to acknowledgement and not just knowledge in the original language. He logically deduces it by saying that if you believe your many works can make you ascend into heaven, and that the works of the law will ensure that you never descend into the dead, that really is to bring Christ not only down, but to make his perfect work worthless. He's really rhetorically asking in a humble manner that you have a zeal for God, but not a knowledge of his work. Christ kept the law perfectly, and that is the end of the law, as he lists in verse 4. Paul brings an idea of unity amongst diversity in saying there is no distinction between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord, the same name, the same finished work is salvation for all in verse 12. And as we know, the, uh, the church of Romans is a diverse church. And everyone who calls on this name will be saved according to verse 13. Romans 10 verse 9 is the very essence of this unity of the heart and the mouth. It is the very call, what we call a call to salvation that Many refer to it as, uh, whether it's in teaching sessions or preaching sessions, it's called a call to salvation. It reads that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, not your works, not how good you are, but God himself raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. 
in articulating this unity, we have to understand the philosophy behind it because these questions will arise. So Paul eloquently also demonstrates that there can be a disunity between the heart and the mouth. What may be in your words is not necessarily in your heart. And a misled heart usually subconsciously seeks to exalt itself or others for the sake of self, but never God. That's what we see in churches all throughout the nations today. They are either all heart uh, or all mind, all emotionalism and sentimentalism, or all about legalism. From my experience in the field, uh, if the benefit and advancement of others is not in your heart, all your convictions and theology, no matter how learned and how accurate they may be, it will be repulsive to others. Since without the heart of Christ, all you will have are repetitious and religious dogmas, Phariseeism. And I assure you, these dogmas will never build anyone up. They'll only lead to stigmas, marks of disgrace, and scars in others, and ultimately yourselves. You know, friends, in our last segment, we talked about a profound encounter between Pontius Pilate and Jesus. When Jesus was being questioned, he in turn questions his questioner. Why? So he may reason and proclaim the truth. When presented with the truth, it was up to the, his questioner to either accept or reject the truth. Malcolm Muggeridge, the, the English journalist turned prolific exor exhorter of Christianity, once said, if you continue to give truth to a person who seeks it not, so if you continue to give truth to a person who seeks it not, is to give them more things to misinterpret. We see this in Pilate's cynical and refutational answer of what is truth before he leaves the conversation with Jesus. The way my mind operated as I was growing <laughs> in my faith was that I had many questions, but seldom did I have pastors that had the heart of Jesus. This all changed in seminary for me. I met some of the most gifted, not only teachers, but loving ministers and spiritual mentors. Most churches are unwelcoming to questions or categorize inquisitive minds, such as people like us, as unspiritual for having questions. Uh, folks, let me give you some biblical facts that are direct and this cannot be misinterpreted. Questions are not bad. In fact, Jesus asks more questions than he is asked in the Gospels. Depending on your translation version, Jesus was asked 120, 183 questions, and he in turn asked 307 questions. Questions are not bad. Jesus reasoned with people so they may know and believe, which in essence is captured by the Apostle Paul in verse 14. He says, how will they believe if they haven't heard? Paul goes on to quote the prophet Isaiah in regards to hearing this message of good news, or in Greek it's called euangelion, which is the word for the gospel. And it's also where we get our word in English for evangelism from euangelion. In verses 16 through 19, he quotes Isaiah 53 and Psalm 19. And most of you may know this, that Isaiah 53 is all about Christ, the suffering servant. That Christ was raised up to bear our burdens, and Psalm 19 illustrates that this saving message, the gospel of salvation of our great God, has not just gone out in all the earth, but to the ends of the earth. And Psalm 19 climaxes with the same language used by the Apostle Paul uh, in, in Romans 10, a unity of the heart and a confession of the mouth. Psalm 19.14 reads, May these words of my mouth and this meditation in my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Folks, Jesus is that firm rock that we confess with our mouths. And Jesus is who our hearts delight in and have confidence in. For with this profession, he is our redeemer. 
In the Johannian words of John chapter 3, verse 17, John says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. This is what Paul emulates, that his heart's desire is for his readers to be saved. And this can also be seen in Moses' heart for the Jewish believer and audience. In Exodus 32, after the event of the golden calf that was done uh, under the supervision of Aaron, their priest, by the way, (laughs) Moses pleads with God uh, with, with a pastoral heart. He says, God, oh, what a great sin these people have committed. They've not just made a God, lowercase g, of their own, but in doing so, they rejected their Lord, their Redeemer. So Moses pleads with God to forgive the sins of his people, even if it costs him his own salvation, even if God has to remove Moses' name from his book. This is the same emotion and desire that Paul demonstrated in our last segment of Romans 9, so to the Church of Romans, where in verse 3 of chapter 9, he said, I wish that I myself were cut off from Christ, if for the sake of my brothers. This, my friend, is a pastor's heart, to place people in front of the Lord, not Lord over them, to present the sufficiency of Scripture by sufficiently explaining the scriptures in love with the hope that others may advance ahead of us. This is what is meant to be a disciple of Jesus. The Greek word mathetheis or mathetheo, uh, which is a root word, meant to be an active learner, so not passive, but one who was inquisitive and engaged to sufficiently learn. Unfortunately, we are seeing a decline in the pulpits uh, because of our relativistic and pluralistic societies today. Now, pastors, what we see more commonly today is that pastors read the scripture to get great talks and sermons out of it, not to actively learn. There's this religious elitism mentality that has set in, and there's nothing left to learn. If we don't continue to learn from the scriptures, that means the light of the word is not illuminating our own iniquities and sins daily. But Jesus said in Luke 9 that whoever wants to be his disciple must deny themselves take up their, and take up their cross daily. Not just on Sundays or Good Friday or team meetings and retreats and leadership events, and, but daily. The Apostle Paul says to the church of Thessalonians to pray unceasingly. Why? Because we sin unceasingly. Even a person like David, a man after God's own heart, utters the prayer in Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and reveal to me the offenses of my sins. And God searches us through his word. His word convicts. You know, uh, Sometimes you almost get this image, right? There's the great philosophers and the great poets. See, the problem with the, it's almost like the pastors are following the great philosophers without actual in-depth study. You know, the great philosophers, what they try to do is they try to fit the in, uh, infiniteness, like the in, infinity of, he, of the heavens. They try to fit the heavens into their heads. But the great poets, all they wanted to do were to just stick their heads into the heavens for a moment. You know, they wanted to be inspired to write about it, to speak about it. Friends, have, we have to have this balance. Yes, we, you, you cannot have biblical wisdom without biblical knowledge. But just because you have biblical knowledge doesn't mean you have biblical wisdom. That's what these illustrations really mean. So, Christians, pastors... When is the last time you prayed that prayer that David prayed in Psalm 139? Search me, O God, and reveal to me the offenses of my sins. When is the last time that prayer was prayed with your mouth and actually you meant to seek an answer in your heart? 
It is the very words of God that we preach. But how many times has our words been ignorant, as Paul said in Romans 10, of the righteousness of God while establishing our own? Would you answer God while reading the first three verses of Romans 10 with this, new, with this perspective instead? And how many times have you, just like the Englishman, not understood the skill set of the God-given abilities that is given to people, but just continue to bombard people and inundate people with teachings? If I had to paraphrase the Apostle Paul from verses 14 through 15, he says, How will they call on Christ if they have not believed in their heart? And how will they believe if they haven't heard the sufficiency of of his word. And how are they to hear the sufficiency of the word if one is not sufficiently preaching the word? And how will they sufficiently preach if they are not sufficiently sent? You are representing the very words of God. Do you sufficiently spend time speaking with him? Spend time with God, study his word, be ready in season and out of season with patience and diligence and pray the prayer that Paul, uh, it's, it's almost like a tongue twi- a twister, pray the prayer that Paul prayed. <laughs> but pray the prayer that Paul prayed in Colossians chapter 4, verses 4, to th- 4 through 6. He says, pray that we may proclaim clearly as we should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. In a world where most of us either uh, have either tender hearts and tender minds, or hard hearts and hard minds, we are called to reflect Christ instead. Christ said in Matthew 10 to be innocent as doves, and wise as serpents, to have tender hearts but sharp minds, so we may hold captive every defiant argument and thought and make it obedient to Christ. Now, many of you by now uh, have uh, probably envisioned a specific pastor, a church, or even a group leader, or a youth group, or, or some kind of mentor after hearing all this. You might have assigned the, that this is, this is who this person is after hearing all of this. That these are their issues they need to work on since you, or uh, let's just say I am not a preacher, pastor, or a proclaimer of the gospel. The leader of the apostles, Peter, wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, and I'll paraphrase, Christians united with the royal priest, Christ Jesus, are now a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him. You are to be proclamators as well. Now, the most common sentiment I usually hear on why folks don't share the gospel that much is because they feel that they haven't grown in their knowledge uh, in the scriptures yet, and they may fail if they're ever challenged. Did you know the apostles had this very same fear as well? When Jesus teaches them to be innocent as doves, but wise as serpents in Matthew 10, he also said that his followers will be brought in front of governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. The apostles questioned Jesus in return. How will they know what to say? This is intimidating. This is overwhelming. And Jesus answered that the Spirit of God would speak through them. God has shown us that his work is sufficient, and so is the sufficiency of his words. The Holy Spirit of God is who sanctifies us by mortifying our old selves so Christ can be formed in us. And this happens by the preaching of the gospel, the words of God, the words inspired by his Holy Spirit. As we close today, I've got a short cultural Hebrew anecdote I'd like to share with you. You know, in uh, biblical times, they didn't have the footwear that we all enjoy uh, today. 
like our sneakers and fancy shoes and stuff like that. That's the reason why they would have foot washing basins by the entrance of, of their homes to wash the dirt off their feet. And there was an old Hebrew saying about followers and the students of a teacher. The saying was, uh, which means to cover yourself with the dust of their feet. This was a saying uh, to illustrate that students who truly loved and followed their teacher, followed their teacher so closely that the dust of his feet, the dust of the feet of the teacher, would stick to the closely following students in his footsteps. The sand was so fine, especially if you go to the Holy Land today, the sand was so fine that it would not just stick to the followers' feet, but stick to their clothes as well, thus giving them the scent and the very uh, ground that he's walked on, giving, him, giving them that scent of the one that they closely followed. Think about this image as you read Romans 10 verse 15 again. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel the gospel of Christ, closely following in Christ's footsteps, that our entire expression and the entire preaching and exhortation of the gospel has his scent in it. Friends, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. In that room that for, became a forever memory, as Jesus grabbed a towel and a wash basin to wash the feet of his disciples, he washed their feet with his righteousness. He washed their feet so they may walk in truth. And oh, how beautiful they are now as they are washed to follow in his footsteps, to follow him. Friends, as we close today, I've got a short poem by Deborah Ann titled, Let the Truth Guide You. Let the truth guide you. Let it lead your way. So on the narrow path, you'll continue to stay. For without the truth, there are only lies, causing you to take your eyes off the prize. Let the truth be your rule. Let it be your banner. So into the straight gate, you will surely enter. For without the truth, lies await to deceive, making you doubt everything you believe. Let the truth guide you. Let it direct you to listen and follow. Jesus' voice is in and working through you. And that, my friends, is the dwelling of his Holy Spirit, the very words of God, the scriptures that we have. He will speak in and through you. So friends, let's pray as we close today. And and as, as always, I want to remind you that, you know, a lot of these sermons are are our it's our foundation it's our structure if you ever need to go more in depth we encourage you to reach out to us with your questions we are here to resource and equip you your success is what we're here for to place you in front of our savior let's pray lord heavenly father we just thank you and praise you for who you are we thank you that although the path might be difficult you walked in it first that if we follow you so closely that we are followers not only of truth but we pave the way for our generations for our families our, our our households our communities and our nations lord may we may you burn a desire in our hearts to study your word to spend time in your word so your word can take root in our lives so we may have a, a renewed understanding of your word and that your word can work in and through us. Lord, I pray that you bless all the people that are listening to this at whatever, whenever time that they do. Lord, I pray that you bless them and help them focus on your words to find themselves in front of your presence in prayer, in devotion, in study, in complete subservience. In Jesus' mighty name precious and holy righteous name do we pray amen friends i'll see you next